Amen. I'm tempted to ask how many know what sheaves are. I'm thinking of the young people here and we're singing, bringing in the sheaves and they're maybe thinking, well, what does that really mean, bringing in the sheaves? And um, I just want to say this. If you don't know the answer to that question, and you may not know the answer to that question, I'm not going to embarrass anybody putting your hand up, but if you don't know, I want you to ask James Lowe and then he'll be able to tell you and then come and tell me. All right, okay. Praise the Lord. Um, Let's read from the scriptures. We're going to read from Proverbs chapter 10. Just, Just a short reading. Proverbs chapter 10. There's a verse of scripture here that I want to leave with you for tonight. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1. Let's hear the word of God. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing. But righteousness delivereth from death. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. Blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. The wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. He that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. He that winketh with the eye causeth sorrow. But a prating fool shall fall. The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. Hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. Amen. We'll end the reading there at verse 12, and we pray God will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of his own infallible word. Amen. Now, my text tonight is taken from Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 5. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. And my theme tonight is, are you sleeping or serving in the harvest time? You see, Proverbs chapter 10 verse 5 is another text out of the 53 texts in the Bible that mention the subject of the harvest. Now, the book of Proverbs itself has been described as laws from heaven for life on earth. That's a good description of it. It's a practical, very down-to-earth book, a book full of sound and good advice about living out our lives from day to day before God. In fact, the entire 31 chapters cover every aspect of life itself, even from the day of one's birth right up to the day of our death and all of life in between. It even covers what happens after death in the world to come. Someone has wisely said, a chapter a day keeps the devil at bay. The key verse is Proverbs 9 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And is not the real key to life on earth that we live out our lives to know the Lord, to to fear him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to to worship him as the living and the true God, and and to serve him as the Lord our God. And, And as you inspire and and strive to do this, you're going to learn. You must wisely use your time and wisely use your talents. Look at our text. 
Listen again to the words. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causes shame. Here's a welcome encouragement. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son. Note also here a warning exhortation. But he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causes shame. And literally, of course, the words apply to the harvest of the earth. And any farmer here will, will agree to them. They'll say they're true. But they also equally apply to the spiritual harvest, to the real business that every born-again believer and every true Christian church should be engaged in, namely the ingathering of precious souls to the Lord and seeing them built up in their most holy faith. Now, as we look at these words tonight carefully, As we think of the theme, are you sleeping or serving in the harvest time? I want you to notice three things. Because these are the three things that come to my mind as I looked up this reference. Think of serving in the harvest days. The time of harvest is a vital matter to be considered. Surely the day of ingathering is a vital part of life, not only in our land, but especially in the land of Israel. This is true literally. It has to be true spiritually. You, you see, the reference to the summer and the reference to the harvest is really a reference to the barley harvest that, that's brought in from mid-April right through to near the end of May, beginning of June, and then followed that uh, with another harvest called the wheat harvest that, that was brought in usually at the end of September into the month of October. Now the day in which the church of Jesus Christ and the Christian lives are harvest days. We live in a day of grace. And during this period, men and women can hear the gospel. They're exhorted to repent and believe the gospel message. They're they're told about their sin and their need to be saved. They're urged and exhorted to get right with God. They're, They're told to love the Lord and live for him and be loyal unto him. You see, these are summer days of opportunity for the church, for the Christian. These are summer days of opportunity for you to be saved If you're not yet saved, remember what Jeremiah said. We we mentioned him briefly this morning. The the, uh, harvest has passed. The summer has ended. But you are not yet saved. And of course, these are summer days of opportunity to evangelize those without Christ, those without God and hope in the world. And it's our desire that they're brought into Christ through faith in him. God has given the church a great opportunity to go out and to seek to win men and women to the Savior. And we're well aware the day in which we live is a day of iniquity, a day of immorality, a day of depravity. Terrible things are happening right across the world. Not only natural disasters, but uh, uh, there's been an implosion of immorality, a spirit of lawlessness is abroad. But in the midst of this depravity, iniquity, and immorality, God has given us days of opportunity. Opportunities to go out in his name and preach Christ. And to tell men and women that God loves them. And that Christ has died for them. And that they can trust him and they can be saved. The sin problem can be dealt with. And they've got the assurance if they have faith in Christ of a home in heaven. And they have the joy of knowing the Lord and the joy of having him uh, with them uh, along life's journey. And that's one of the greatest blessings in life to know the Lord is with you in the onward march of life. And to be able to say with the psalmist, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, of course, one of the qualifications for service is sonship. The Lord Jesus told a parable, Matthew 21, verse 28, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And the question of question I want to ask tonight is this. Are you a child of God? 
Are you saved by the grace of God? Have you been washed in the blood of Christ? Have you been born again of the Spirit of God? Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? You see, the reality is none of us are sons by nature. We're not physically born the sons of God. And you only can become a son or a daughter by birth. And what is true literally is also true spiritually. Jesus said, marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. There's no such thing as the universal fatherhood of God. God is not the father of all men, especially in the aspect of redemption. There's no such thing as the universal brotherhood of man. That's heretical. That's unscriptural. Do you know that even today there's many serving the Lord? And they're doing a work of harvesting among the children of men. But they're not the sons of God. They've never been born again. They've not been adopted into God's family. And it's not one of the big problems in the church. You you have men there as servants of the Lord, but they're not the sons of God. Was not true of John Wesley? How he engaged in the work of harvesting for many, many years. Yet he wasn't God's son. His heart one day was warmed. By the Spirit of God, hearing the preface to Luther's commentary in the book of Romans in that Aldergate's meeting house. And then he became a son. You see, only a son can wield the sickle of prayer and call on God as Father. Only a son can practice true religion. Only a son can preach in the power and demonstration of the Spirit of God. Serving in the harvest days. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son. I want you to think secondly of sleeping in the harvest days. It says, but he that sleepeth in harvest. We'll pause there. Now, what does that mean? Sleepeth in harvest. We could apply it literally. We can also apply it spiritually. I want to say that there's nothing wrong with sleep. We need sleep in order to live. We couldn't live without sleep. Doctors tell us that we need about eight hours to function in a healthy way. Some, of course, can do with four or five hours per night, but but we are built differently. Some need more sleep than others, but on average we sleep seven to eight hours per night. Someone has said we sleep about a third of our lives. Now think of that. A third of our lives. If you live to your 70... You've slept 23 years of your life. It's also a fact that every hour you sleep, you're burning off about 70 calories. So there's no need to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning or half, 4 or 5 o'clock and run to the gym and do a jog around the 4 miler and carry it off. And here's the reason why. Because those that are still sleeping to 7 o'clock, they're still burning off calories. And that's a known fact. He that sleepeth in harvest is not really a reference to, to normal rest. It's a reference to a person who is lazy, a person who is wasting time, a person who has become idle. You think of somebody who's lying in bed and it's daylight and it's 2 p.m. in the afternoon or 3 p.m. in the afternoon and he's still not up. So so it's a reference to somebody who's wasting his time, who who is being idle. And that's what I want you to think about. Because this individual is sleeping when he needed to be involved in service. The reference to harvest. Harvest is hard work. Remember in those days there was no combine harvesters, no fancy tractors. All they had was the sickle and the scythe. They worked from dawn to dusk. And you can think about the laborers coming in from the field and their body would have been tired. And uh, no doubt their arms and legs sore. And they have kept going from dawn to dusk because this is the time of ingathering. This is the day of harvest. And one thing they, that the laborers cannot do is sleep in the harvest. Why? Because that would be a waste of time. And the reference to sleeping in harvest is is not a reference to, to normal rest. It's a reference to being idle in life. 
in a spiritual sense. It's all about squandering time. You see, when you sleep, you can't see. You can't sleep with your eyes open. There's a story told about an older man who was watching the news and he was sleeping, at least his eyes was closed, and he was snoring, he was making noises when the family came in. The volume in the TV was loud, people could have heard it upside. One of the sons picked up the remote, he changed the channel, and there was a grunt from the chair and the voice said, put that back, I'm watching that. And the voice of the son said, but you're sleeping, Dad. And he says, no, I'm just resting my eyes. And you see, when you're sleeping, and really in a sound sleep, you can't see. And how many Christians tonight, how many churches, how many that are Christless are spiritually asleep and they can't see what God is doing. And God calls out, awake thou that sleepest. Tell you something else, when you're sleeping you can't hear. Those who are heavy sleepers, and I would profess to be one of them, there could be ten people in the room wrecking the place, charging about like elephants, and I would be oblivious to all that's going on. I, I wouldn't hear them. And you see, many that are spiritually asleep not only can't see, but they can't hear. They, they can't hear what God is saying. They, they've got no word from heaven to arouse them. That this word, awake thou that sleepest, is falling on deaf ears. And when a person's asleep, in a deep sleep, they're unresponsive. They're not responding to what is going on around them. And isn't that true literally? It's also true spiritually. How many that are spiritually asleep and Christ means nothing to them. And the preaching of the word of God means nothing. And the church itself means nothing. They're, 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 they're unresponsive in their spirit. They can, can come and go from the place of the holy, but, but they're asleep in a spiritual sense and there's no impact upon them. And they need to awake. They need to have their eyes open. They need to be made responsive. They need to hear from heaven. Doesn't the Bible say to us, redeem the time? Why? Because the days are evil. It's not only a waste of time sleeping in the harvest days, but it's a waste of opportunity. Notice the words, in the harvest. You see, harvest is a day of reaping, a day of ingathering. This is the only opportunity to reap the crop. There's important work to be done. Isn't it true this evening, if you think of the law of nature, the crops of the earth, the barley, the wheat, the oats, the rye. It must be harvested at the appropriate time. If the time is squandered and wasted, then you've also lost a wonderful opportunity to gather in the harvest. And the poor farmer's tearing his hair out. You think about corn left to rot in the field. Wheat that's perishing. The potatoes Fruit in the tree that's overripe that, that you wouldn't want to eat. And the, the orchard growers thinking, well, there's no point of picking it now. You see, that's the point. Sleeping in harvest is not only a waste of time because it speaks of idleness and slothfulness, but it's a waste of opportunity. The Lord Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is yet day, for the night cometh when no man can work. He says in John 4 verse 34, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye there yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look in the fields for they're white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Life is not a rehearsal. Young people. And if you look at this text, it's addressed to young people. This is one of the wise proverbs of Solomon. He that gathereth in summer is what? A wise son. But he that sleepeth in the harvest is a son that causes shame. It's direct to the sons, 
to, to the young people. What are you doing for God? I say to you, don't waste your time. Think of this wise son and this foolish son. Don't waste your God-given opportunity. Don't waste your God-given life. Life, as I've said, is not a rehearsal. Don't waste hours on Facebook. So much you couldn't set it aside for God. Don't waste hours playing the the video games or or, or the football games or, or the shooting games. When you can't set it aside for God. Don't don't waste hours in bed. Maybe you've been out the night before. You're not coming in to the the small hours. And then you can't get up the next day. And your body's tired. That's what I'm saying. The Bible tells us, remember, now thy creator in the days of thy youth. The the time to serve God is now. Because the day will come when you may not care about the things of God. You may not care about God himself. And even in light of the judgment to come, you'll still not care. And what I'm saying tonight is use your youth to serve the Lord. Because the reason for service or the season for service, it's limited. It's brief, it's short. Life passes very quickly. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. We look back. And some who are older here can look back. And we think of where is all the time gone to? You see, life is brief. Live in the summer of your health and strength. And do all you can for God, as long as you can, for his honor and glory. There's this little story told about Jonathan Goforth. He was a missionary to China. And uh, he was born in 1859 in Canada in the year of revival. His mother's name was Jane Bates. And she actually came from Northern Ireland. I'm not sure of what she came from, uh, which town or village. And if anybody knows, you can maybe tell me. But I do know she came from Northern Ireland. And this man did a great work for God in China. And he had this saying. You have all eternity to welcome victories. But only a few hours to win them. And in China... God blessed this man and gave him a great summer of opportunity. And under his ministry, hundreds of Chinese individuals came to saving faith in Christ. Let me tell you another little story about another man who was a great missionary to China. His name was Hudson Taylor. And uh, he he was converted when he was a teenager. And he, he set sail for China when he was 21. And he was a missionary in China for 51 years. And did you know when he was born, this is what his mother and father prayed. They were Methodists. And they prayed, Lord, grant that he may do a work in China. And the very prayer of mommy and daddy was was fulfilled in the life of Hudson Taylor. But while he was out there preaching, there was a man came to hear him preach. And he said this to Hudson Taylor, I have sought the truth for a very long time. I and the father before me, and I have found it. Mr. Taylor, I've discovered there's nothing in Buddhism. There's nothing in Confucianism. I have found the truth and the peace that my soul longs for in faith in Christ. Sometime later, they were having dinner, and he began to ask Hudson Taylor, as you do around the dinner table, how long have you been saved? So he told him when he was a teenager. And how long have you known about the Lord? Oh, from from I was an infant. Mummy and daddy uh, told me about the Lord and taught me the word of God. And how long have the people in your land, the land of England, known the truth of God and salvation through faith in Christ alone? Hudson Taylor says, a long time, many centuries And this is what the wee Chinese man said, sitting at the dinner table. Well, why did you not come sooner? See, remember what he said? I have been searching for the truth for a long time and my father before me. Neither found rest in Buddhism or Confucianism or any other man-made religion and came to find rest and peace through trusting in Christ. Why not come sooner? Let me ask, would one of our neighbours say that to us? A family member? A stranger? 
Why did you not come sooner and tell me about Christ and the need for my soul and about my sin? Could the answer be that we're spiritually asleep in the harvest days? I, I could tell you tonight, I, I don't want to prolong the meeting, but I could tell you about Christians that are found sleeping in the Bible. Remember Elijah sleeping under the juniper tree, having run for his life from Jezebel because he heard there was a threat against him and he had slaughtered or helped to slaughter uh, 850 prophets, 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the grove. He was in fear for his life. He had run. He was physically exhausted. And he had to be awakened by an angel before he could eat. Think of Jonah. Asleep in a boat. Running from the will of God. The mighty prophet of God to Nineveh. Think about the disciples in the garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus had to come and says... Um, Having told him to watch and pray. What could you not watch with me one hour? Think of Samson. Where did he fall asleep? Did he not fall asleep in the lap of Delilah the harlot? And when his hair was shorn. Remember he, he said that he would go out at other times. When she said Samson the Philistines be upon thee. But the Bible tells us in Judges 16 and 20. He wished not that the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. Samson had lost his power. He had lost the presence of the Lord. He had lost his practical usefulness. He had lost his cutting edge for God. Why? Because being asleep spiritually had led him to sin and iniquity. And I could go on tonight. Elijah, Jonah, the disciples, Samson, and there's others. And this is a reality. Sleeping in the harvest days. How many churches tonight are asleep in the harvest days? Isn't there a danger in the free Presbyterian church of middle class complacency? A danger for us, we've got this lovely new building. And we forget the work that God has called us to do. And God has called us, of course, to, to erect this building. And, and we've opened it to the glory of God now. But God is calling us not only to this material building. He's calling us to see this building spiritually built up for his glory. And that will involve you. And I'm just going to explain how. It will involve your participation. And we appreciate your faithfulness in the services in the Lord's day and at other times. There's a wee man in Sandy Row and he used to say to the late Ernie Patterson, Didn't he forget the church? And I want to say that to all of you, and especially the young people. And we know it's easy to be slack in attendance and to forget it's the Lord's day and forget to go to the Lord's house. And not only participate in the church services, but come to the prayer meetings. We need young people in our prayer meetings. Maybe you think, well, I'm too busy. Maybe you think, well, I'm too tired. Maybe you think, well, I'm too depressed. I'm too hurt by life's circumstances. I want to tell you if you are, the best thing that you can do is go to the prayer meeting and talk to the Lord and tell him where you're at. We need you to be involved in the preaching of the word of God. You, you may not do it in an official capacity like I am. But you can do it by sharing your testimony and inviting your neighbors and friends to come in under the sound of the word of God. And we need to most of all practice what we preach. We, we must have a love for the Savior. And that love for the Savior will mean love for the saints and love for the souls as well as the Sabbath and the sanctuary. And, and we'll, we'll lay aside our tithe. And we'll want to use our talent. And we'll not waste our time. We'll make the most of the opportunity. And we'll thank God he's given us an opportunity to work and to witness for him as well as to worship him. And we'll engage in it now. You see, that's what it means when Solomon gave this proverb, sleeping in the harvest. That's what he was thinking. Wasting time and wasting opportunity. Don't waste time and idleness. Don't waste the opportunity. 
Let's hear God's call, awake thou that sleepest. And one final thing, if you look at our text, there's a shame in the harvest days. What does he say about he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causes shame? What a rebuke. It's not only about squandering time and wasting the opportunity for service, but this attitude affects and dilutes his character. The word shame has to do with disappointment, embarrassment, humiliation. Now, notice what it says. But he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causes shame. In other words, it's bringing disappointment, humiliation, and embarrassment to his father. And you think of the harvest field. And you think of the workers out there. And they're working from dawn to dusk. Remember the sickle and the scythe. And somebody's looking around and saying, Where's Joan? Is he not out of bed yet? What time is it? It's 11 o'clock. Sure, we've been out of here since 7 and before it. And, and there's a bit of talk among the workers. Maybe one said, Well, I blame the dad. Sure, you should go and throw a bucket of water around him and give him a good thump and say, Come on, boy, get out of bed. You can just picture what's going on. A real family. You see, it reflects in one's character. And, and I would say to you, young people, remember this. Be in time for the house of God. Be polite in the house of God. Speak to one another. You, you younger, speak to the, the elder. Be, be friendly. And be true to, 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 to the fact that you're saved by the grace of God. And God has called you to serve. And you're volunteering. What can I do for God? Remember who you are. You see, that's what a father said to a son on one occasion. Son, remember who you are. What do you mean, Dad? Remember you carry my name. And as you live out your life, your character reflects in me. And the young fellow never forgot it. And what is true in a real family situation, and this is what Solomon was thinking about, is equally true in the redeemed family of God. We have a heavenly father. We have a glorious savior, Jesus Christ. We've been born of the spirit. And, and really we're in one family, united in Christ. And we're spiritually related to each other. We're brothers and sisters. And you know, God as Heavenly Father could come. Christ as our Lord and Savior could come. And he could say to us, remember, you carry my name. You, you carry the name Christian. You carry the name that you're mine, that you belong to me. And if you're redeemed, then awake thou that sleepest. Awake to righteousness. You see, the church of Christ is struggling for laborers. We, we need workers today. In this church and in all our congregations. And I'm sure this is true of the church of the firstborn in Northern Ireland. We need watchers in the wall. Who buy the truth and sell it not. We need young people who know what they believe. And, and who love the truth and will sell it not. Many young free Presbyterians don't know. What this church really believes. When it comes to God and Christ and the Bible and heaven and hell. And moral issues. Oh, we need that to change. And, and we need wheelers. People who'll come and, and, and they'll cry to God in, in the prayer meeting. And we need worshippers. All this ties in as I finish. C.T. Studd was a great cricketer. He was a millionaire. And he gave up all his money to serve the Lord. And he said this, I have only one life. It will soon be past. And only what's done for Christ will last. And I want you to remember that. There's a shame in the harvest days. We don't want God to be disappointed Embarrassed by the fact that we bear testimony to his name. Remember what John said as we finish in John chapter 1 and verse 28. And I leave this reference with you. Listen to this statement. 
In John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, it says this. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Why would be ashamed at his coming? Because we have been spiritually asleep. Saved, but asleep. That'll bring us shame. The loss of reward. Is that true of you tonight? If it is, go and seek the Lord. Make sure that you've heeded the call to awake to righteousness. Awake thou that sleep as God says. And make sure that you'll not be ashamed when he comes. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for listening.